uh, had a prescribed fire here with uh, able support of and uh, guidance from our Department of Agriculture's forestry section along with some uh, state park staff and we burned about 25 acres. Uh, the area immediately to my left here uh, we burned on the 27th of February so uh, and you'll notice it's pretty green. Uh, there's a couple of smaller dead pine trees right here which was one of our objectives. In fact we were hoping to create some canopy gaps to allow more sunlight to hit the forest floor for a lot of rare plant species and we'll go down and take a look at that in a moment. But in the distance you can see Gordon's Pond. On the 28th we burned much of that marsh that's out there and the areas of pine immediately to the east towards the ocean. And uh, we were very conservative when we did the burn. We were hoping to kill very few trees this particular time, see clear a lot of uh, under, undergrowth and we were very successful. Um, not that you can always burn in February, I mean there could easily have been five inches of snow here, but um, temperatures were perfect, wind direction was perfect, and so we conducted the burn. And now here we are, it's June 20th, so why don't we take a walk down the dune here and take a look at what's happened on the forest floor. Well this is a little spit of sand that's just out of the, um, what at one time, uh, many years ago before the canal was built was a freshwater marsh and today is a tidal marsh because of the Lewis Rehoboth Canal. But this is upland and it's only about a foot or two above that marsh and um, this is one of the areas that we we put the fire through in February 27th and some of the things that have happened are uh, exactly what we had hoped. Um, you can see these pine trees were already down on the ground and we did not want a fire that would come through here and, and totally consume them. You can see the, the bark is black, but the wood itself didn't really burn. What we did get rid of largely was the needle duff layer that had covered the ground and suppressed a lot of plants. This particular grass, which is very common here, was not in, uh, was not growing in this location last year. Matter of fact, this particular spot was so shady that there wasn't much sunlight, wouldn't have been much sunlight hitting here. And this is exactly what we hoped to have happen. Uh, you can see there, some of these pitch pine trees are doing fabulously. They're still alive. Even this holly here, which is normally very sensitive to fire, is loaded with fruit for next year. Um, and we're seeing a lot of succulent response, uh, including uh, some greenbrier stems here. Here's winged sumac. And all of this is regrowth since the fire. The fire kind of comes through and kills everything at ground level, and all this has grown over the succeeding four months. And so, and actually the fire actually acts like a fertilizer, um, and it releases some nutrients that actually spur some of this growth. And some of these plants are very rare, and uh, we're finding uh, in some portions of this area, some of them are coming back and getting ready to flower by the hundreds when before there were only a half a dozen plants. So the fire accomplished its first goal. Now, eventually there will be a bike path through this area and we'll be putting a little fire break on both sides of that, which will also help a lot of these herbaceous plants. Um, but this was the first burn. There'll need to be another one here, but probably for not about another four or five years. This is a uh, oak sucker. The original oak was not much bigger than this and you can actually see the stems right here. Um, and the fire killed that. One of the things that we, we tried to do out here was select some seed trees that we wanted to ensure would survive the fire. Uh, this pitch pine uh, right off the trail here, you'll notice there's no black on the bark of that tree at all. We actually raked the needles away from the trunk of that tree, removing the fuel. Um, so there was no fire adjacent to that tree to ensure that this tree would survive. But we were so conservative that most of the trees survived anyway. Um, there was enough moisture that even this old rotted uh, pine log here did not burn. This is a uh, young pitch pine and uh, these stems actually came out green after the fire, uh, but some insect attack has killed these. But the interesting thing is, one thing that's unique about pitch pine, if you look down here at the base, you'll see all these brand new shoots coming out of the roots. That is very unusual for pine trees. This just sprouted from seed and it's because this needle 
duff was largely burned off till you get down to the mineral sand. Um, so these sassafras are sprouting here because we did the burn. The seeds might have been sitting there in the soil for uh, several years, but the burn has, and, and that, the amount of sunlight able to hit the forest floor, stimulated the seed with the rain we had this spring to sprout. So we kind of restart the forest. One of the things I noticed when I visited this site in um, April uh, was we had a pair of eastern kingbirds that had set up and nested on one of these pitch pines that the fire had just run across a couple months earlier. And this is typical of sites like this, is a after a fire you get a lot of the same species come back, and in some cases new species that come back and visit these sites. There's very rich forage in here for a lot of species now, uh, where last year they would have had nothing, virtually nothing to eat on the forest floor except pine needles. So a, a prescribed fire like this can be, or in, in some cases a natural fire, which is very difficult for us to allow to happen in an urban setting like Cape and Lopen surrounded by all these communities. So prescribed fires are really our only method, but to let a, a fire come back through here, remove the pine needles, and create this wonderful forage for these animals and cover for these animals again. Hidden among the, the grass are some of our rare plants Here's a little bloom spike of flowers coming up from one of these rare plant species um, that we're really hoping will produce enough seed to not only scatter into this area, but into adjoining areas. So our goal is to have some of these plants not be rare. But to do that, we really, again, needed to burn this site. This was our first burn at Cape Henlopen uh, here in uh, the late winter of 2012. Uh, we need to do more. Um, we're, there are plans to do another burn uh, during the next burning opportunity, probably next spring. Uh, another small area fairly close to this one, so we can uh, start to build on that. And the advantage is not just ecological, like we've been talking about today, but also protects structures, uh, protects us from wildfire events, um, and helps regenerate uh, some of these forests. Um, and with the help of the Department of Agriculture, uh, other departments and divisions within DENREC, Parks and Rec wants to continue this uh, program and ecologically managing our forest here at Cape and Lopen in the right way. Mm -hmm.